Hello, everybody. This is Conrad Franz, joined by Dimitri Kaligan, coming at you with another episode of Ether Hour. This is episode six. We are coming fresh off our first free episode made available to the public out of the goodness of our hearts, where we were with Father Joseph Gleason discussing his latest project, translating the works of Father Konstantin Bufeyev on the issues of creation and evolution from an Orthodox perspective. Be sure to check that one out. But we're back with our normal premium episodes. Of course, we'll have that free preview at the beginning for you cheapskates. But for those of lo- our loyal paying subscribers, this is another you know uncensored hour of our interest show, our niece show, our history show, our esoteric show, our saints show, whatever it is you want to consider it. This is it. And we've got a great subject today discussing some history of the Donbass, some of the heroes there. Dimitri, how are you doing? How are you feeling about this episode today? Excited to be here, Conrad. Of course, this is kind of a passion project of ours. We always wanted to do an episode about some of the heroes and notable figures of the Novorossiya rebellion against Ukraine and the separatists, or better better call, I suppose, unionists, those folks re- responsible for Donetsk and Lugansk now joining the Russian Federation and who wanted to reunite these regions with Russia. There are three particular figures we, which we, I think, should discuss today, and that would be, you know, Igor Strelkov, Motorola and the famous, uh, I suppose, celebrity level um, Givi, who, you know, these three figures I think will be mentioned today in our episode and we'll discuss them quite in depth. And the three figures I think notably are very in- related to each other. They were there from the onset of the conflict right after the Euro Maidan concluded itself in the Ukraine in 2014 and all the way through to the first Minsk Accords and also the second Minsk Accords. So these pre- three particular figures in this Ukraine-Russia early conflict, you could say, interaction narrative played a very key role in, in what we see today in the special military operation and even contemporary, I suppose, history, as well as the future of the region. Uh, these are really defining people in this particular story. You're right. The history books, you know, these are going to be people that are going to be in there. Their pictures are going to be in the little section about the precursor to this huge, now largest conflict of the 21st century that, we, that we're seeing unfold in Eastern Europe. But you mentioned Givi, Motorola, Strelkov, only one of those is still with us today, which, you know, this uh, this episode might be a bit of a downer for some people who admire these figures. But, you know, you say Givi, Motorola, these were these military leaders of the Donetsk People's Republic specifically. The Strelkov was more involved in the Luhansk People's Republic, as were some other figures that also ended up getting assassinated by, by nefarious forces through the course of this conflict. But when we mention Givi and Motorola, Givi, of course, being Mikhail Tolstik, and Motorola being Arsen Pavlov, these were their their you know normal civilian names. Givi and Motorola being their call signs, and these two guys were again sort of just uh, Motorola had a military background, but Givi was just a regular guy. He was a security guard at a supermarket, you know, but he had wanted to be a soldier, but had a speech impediment, so had never been allowed in the military. And then, as Dmitri said, when the Maidan kicked off, these are. These were Russians. These guys saw themselves as Russians. They saw what some of these radicals backed by the State Department and Zog were doing, you know, to this country of Ukraine, which before that had been, at least in the eyes of most people, they're part of the Russian world, at least in the Russian sphere of influence, despite its unfortunate separation. And so they, you know, when some of these, as we see now in their manifestations, they've many of them have been taken out now, but the earliest forms of Azov Battalion right sector, these other radical right-wing Nazi Ukrainian nationalist banderite groups you know they were terrorizing people and these guys took up the call to you know stand up to the well, earliest terror history. bombings of Donetsk remember people always talk about how Donetsk has been bombed for all these years these are the people that actually you know responded to that so we're going to you know get into their backgrounds their lives a bit and also of course some of these intimate and interesting details about the beginning of the Donbass War, which of course has now become what we believe the first front in the Third World War. So these are these are men who have had no no little influence on history, I guess we could put it that way. Yeah, that's right. And the backstory to these particular three figures getting involved in Ukrainian history and the future history of Russia essentially begins at the Euromaidan. So none of this would essentially be possible if not for the CIA coup, which occurred in November 2013 in the capital of Ukraine, Kiev. 
and eventually uh, fizzled out in February 2014. So it lasted roughly four months long, this essentially huge coup and uh, series of riots, which saw, you know, attacks on police officers, attacks on Orthodox churches, um, and essentially was a Western instigated uh, Arab Spring type event in, in the Ukraine itself, which saw the ousting of the, uh, you know, I guess rightfully elected president, Viktor Yanukovych, who took a more pro-Russian stance. His particular residence was raided by pro-Ukrainian militiamen, Western, you know, militiamen. There was a, an abundance of neo-Nazi battalions who also were present at the Maidan riots in Kiev. And all this unrest essentially saw Ukraine kind of scattered and divided amongst itself. And the eastern regions of Ukraine, which are always very pro-Russian and very had a very um, no real affiliation with these new uh, neo-Nazi militia groups, which were you know taking power in Lvov, in Odessa, att- attacking you know pro-Russian forces in Kiev, uh, and as well as Kharkov, they really didn't see themselves as as a one people, as as a united sort of collective. And in fact, this unrest led to. The Donetsk, of course, firstly led to Crimea proclaiming itself independent and joining itself with Russia for a referendum. And the Russian Black Sea Fleet, of course, participated in that particular election and uh, in terms of facilitating it and making sure it was safe and making and preventing any sort of terrorist acts from occurring on the Crimean Peninsula during that early period in 2014. But of course, after Crimea became independent and joined with the rule of Russia, other regions of Ukraine also wanted to join, except they didn't have the same, I suppose, the same geographic ad- advantage as the Crimean Pen- Peninsula had initially. So the, the Donetsk People's Republic and the Lugansk People's Republic initially was just the was just known as the city of Donetsk and its countryside surrounding it, as well as Lugansk, the city of Lugansk, as well as the countryside around it. And these two particular regions were uh, essentially were at risk of uh, essentially being invaded by some of these far right wing militias, and so they needed to. The governments in those particular cities, they wanted to call pro-Russian forces from either Russian volunteers or Crimea in order to essentially defend these particular cities from any pro-Kiev weird regime right wing uh, forces coming in to disrupt any any sort of local referendums and elections. And so there was a call out to Crimea and uh, Crimea sent... 54, or, you know, by official sources, 52 commandos led by a man named Igor Strelkov, who arrived in Donetsk, and in fact, not to Donetsk directly, but arrived in a city to just to the west of Donetsk, which is uh, called Slavyansk. Now, Slavyansk is roughly on the same distance from Donetsk as the city of Bakhmut is today. Bakhmut, you know, notably, probably the largest siege and battle of the 21st century. It's ongoing at the moment, as the, as the recording of this of this video in April 2023. But Slavyansk was essentially the city which Strelkov and some of these early volunteers and defenders of Donetsk chose as their military base. Uh, Strelkov and most of these Donetsk people's volunteers were former, you know, not Strelkov himself, but at least three quarters of those who came with him were all former Ukrainian military men. So it's not like these were people from Russia or Russian servicemen who, you know, decided to overthrow rightful Ukrainian Ukrainian legal structures there. No, a lot of them were former Ukrainians or those who served in Ukraine, served in the Ukrainian SBU, in the Ukrainian Spetsnaz, the Ukrainian VDV forces, and also in the Ukrainian Navy. So a lot of these folks were uh, old former Ukrainian um, patriots who were, you know, essentially saw the truth that Ukraine was falling apart. And they wanted to stand up for the future of their culture and peoples and wanted to unite them with Russia. Strelkov arrived in Slavyansk and surely enough, he realized that soon the city would come under siege once, because this Maidan was already coming to an end. The the riots were fizzling out in Kiev and soon he realized Kiev would be sending its military forces or whatever it had at its disposal towards these rebel- these new newfounded rebellious republics in the east. And Slavyansk would be, I suppose, the first city which would need to be defended and so he quickly uh interviewed some of his some of his forces available and selected several folks to to be his uh, military commanders one of those local commanders who he elected and promoted to the status of an officer was was uh, arseny pavlov who was is known by his nickname motorola now motorola would come to fame as uh, and notably n- notably would become very famous due to his uh you know very talented and active participation in the events, you know, throughout 2014 and 15. And Givi also was, you know, participating in this defense of Slavyansk from the Ukrainian forces in 2014, but he was simply a 
a local Ukrainian serviceman, right? As uh, Konrad, I think, will give us some of his background. Givi arrived at Slavyansk from his home city of Ilovansk in the east of Donetsk, and he also didn't like the new... He, he wasn't a big fan of these pro-Kiev Banderite neo-Nazis, and he also wanted to take a stand, and he was a very pro-Russian Ukrainian. So most of these folks there defending Slavyansk, defending Donetsk, were... Uh, blood and blood, blood and bone Ukrainian people, or at least people from the east of Ukraine who wanted to stand up for a new identity and wanted to kind of unite themselves with Russia. They weren't Russians such as Strelkov. Motorola himself was one of the few Russians who originally was one of the first volunteers who came from Russia. Motorola himself, by origin, was a Russian serviceman. He did serve in the first, uh, in the second Chechen campaign in the early 2000s, and he did have a military background. So he did have some military skill, but not that of an officer, or he didn't have much command experience in the Russian military. And he, but he did serve for a while. Uh, he was uh, around 30 years of age when he arrived in Ukraine at the time, so he wasn't he wasn't too old, and he didn't have that much life experience. But certainly, the events uh, you know that took place in Slavyansk really kind of helped him develop in his uh, career stance. So, Slavyansk became this uh, became this sort of stronghold, this fortress of Don Donetsk, Novorossiya, Russian resistance against the Ukrainian, uh, I suppose, the Ukrainian pro pro Western uh, pro Western forces which were approaching, and these three figures participated in this two-month-long siege, which eventually uh, ended quite well, at least for, for the people of the Donetsk Republics. But maybe Conrad could give us some background as to Givi's origins and who this particular person was and why he became, I suppose, well-known around the internet. Also, Givi, or as we said, Mikhail Tolstik, was a, you know, he was a Ukrainian. He was from the Donbass. He was born in Donetsk. And he ended up, you know, he became probably the most, of all the people on this, he's probably the most, you know, meme famous of all of them based on kind of some videos and clips that have all gone around. But he is a quarter Georgian. That's why his nickname is Givi. That's a, it's a Georgian word. And, you know, his, uh, one of his parents was half Georgian. And he was worked, as we said before, worked as a supermarket security guard. He was at a rope factory at one point and for two years was training in the Ukrainian army before he was rejected for a speech impediment. And he gives in an interview where he talks about how they told him he only wanted true Aryans. So I guess he, you know, his Georgian blood, I guess, disqualified him from the Bandera club. So he, he, he got out of there because of that. But as Dmitry described, he became... In Slavyansk, a lot of these guys made it. Uh, Givi really made his name in the Second Battle of Dun the Donetsk Airport with the Somalia Battalion, which is the group that he led. And during that battle afterwards, he was filmed with a line of Ukrainian prisoners of war, and he was yelling at them and excoriating them for being complicit in what he viewed as you know, crimes and terrorism committed on the people of Donetsk by the Ukrainian government and their Western sponsors. And at one point, he, you know, starts punching one of them in the face, and then he pulls out a machete and cuts off two of their patches and makes them eat the Ukrainian flag that they had on them. And that's about really the extent of what happened. But he was then, of course, of course, accused of being a war criminal, and people are like, who knows what he's doing off camera if he's doing this? And, you know, later in the video, Givi, you know, really interrogates the officer, who's the guy that he was punching, the leader of the group that was captured by the militia. And he's, you know, explaining to him that, you know, just the other day, you know, there were children killed in this cluster bombing from the Ukrainian military. Like, he, he clearly was a very, you know, passionate person, someone who, you know, was not afraid to charge into the heat of battle, as Dmitry explained. There's a lot less people participating in these battles than that is, than is going on now with the huge militaries mobilized on both sides. These are volunteers who, you know, took up arms when they felt was needed to be, what was needed to be done. And they thought there was a good chance that... It wouldn't happen, but, you know, here we are. These places are not officially part of the Russian Federation, which Givi, in many interviews, you can find some good interview content with him on the Graham Phillips YouTube channel. He talks about how he sees the Donbass as fundamentally part of Russia, and he agrees with the political vision of Vladimir Putin and, you know, general Russian nationalism. That's He very explicitly expressed that that was his political perspective and why he took the stance that he did, and then ultimately, when the people that were taking such stance were attacked, he decided to stand up and fight back. And between the war crimes thing and some other, he, in some of the videos with Graham, he talks about how, you know, he didn't drink, 
He exclusively really drank tea. He was very into tea. He was a big Jason Statham fan. And at one point he reads out some bizarre, you know, weird character, weird amount of, no, weird number with a weird amount of characters <laughs> to a group, to a, a camera recording him for women that want to marry him and all the letters they've sent him after he's gone famous on Russian television. He reads out like some satellite phone number to be sent to Russia for people who wanted his phone number, which, you know, he was a very colorful character. He does speak with a bit of a lisp, but he is a pretty good communicator. He's not like a low IQ guy. You know, these were, these were patriotic characters who, again, unlike some other characters that were taken out and killed through the, over the course of the Donbass, you know, civil war and revolution and everything going on in Ukraine. And as Dmitry said, more of their, the unionist as opposed to separatist, that's really what makes the term that makes more sense. Givi and Motorola, they were not particularly political. They weren't being appointed to like Ministry of Defense positions in these republics. They were not being, you know, paraded. They were not speaking directly through some channels of their own to the Russian people trying to send an extremely specific message towards the Moscow government or whatnot. So Many have said that there is a possibility that they were taken out by the Kremlin itself who feared them for, you know, their quick rise in popularity and that they could lead a political uprising against, against you know, the current powers that be due to their rapid popularity and the kind of volatility of the situation on the Ukrainian border. But due to the lack of political aspirations of these guys, apparently, it, it would make more, much more sense to just believe the report of Yuri Butasov, who in 2022 said that the SBU ran a counterintelligence offer. They had a counterintelligence unit that approved and acted on the assassination of Givi, which occurred four months after the assassination of Motorola, who was killed in an elevator. Givi was killed at his office in Donetsk after a massive bomb explosion went off in the specific room within the office that he was in. And you know, this this journalist Yuri Butasov claims that that was directly approved by Petro Poroshenko, which at this point makes a lot more sense than any kind of theory that he was taken out by the Kremlin or, you know, Russian intelligence. Yeah, that's right. I think Givi's particular accolades, of course, fall on, as Conrad mentioned, the uh, Battle of the Donetsk Airport, which essentially was taking uh, taking place after the famous International Minsk Accords, which was supposed to bring peace between these two republics, uh, Donetsk and Lugansk and the Ukrainian state, you know, signed by Putin and, of course, confirmed with Poroshenko. But unfortunately, the Donetsk Airport itself was this particular zone which fell illegally, speaking according to the Minsk Accords, it was supposed to be given to the Donetsk People's Republic, but the Ukrainian forces still occupied it. So what the uh, forces of the Donetsk People's Republic did was send its military forces to essentially take the airport back. And what resulted was essentially a, a several weeks long siege in which Givi, as well as Motorola, in cooperation, Motorola at that point was leading a uh, a particular battalion called Sparta, and so they were called the Spartans. And this particular battalion specialized in infantry attacks and frontline assaults. In many m many in which Motorola actually participated in himself. Meanwhile, Givi and his Somalian battalion was in charge of the uh, covering artillery fire. So basically, positioning themselves towards the towards the back line, defending any sort of uh, essentially firing at the Ukrainian positions from from a distance and essentially providing cover so the two of them worked very well and you know the two of them can be seen uh in interviews smiling they were really good friends and associates as well as perhaps they had the most media coverage as conrad mentioned both of them would appear in numerous youtube clips a lot of these clips by the way have been removed from youtube as well at least from back in the day because youtube did begin uh banning pro-russian videos and sources at least in the russian language after the beginning of the special military operation yeah.